here in the hospital, I mean, we're doing a lot uh, because I do a lot of clinical work. So um, we evaluated protein intake in the elective hip and knee surgery patients. So the older population, but these are not sick. They're coming in for a new knee or new hip. So this is a new generation of patients that we get, of course, because in the past that was associated with a lot of pain. But these are patients that want to go, go skiing with the grandchildren again. So they want a new hip or new knee. So they come in, they're very healthy, but in the four days that they're in the hospital, so the advice, uh, to go back to the advice, ESPEN guidelines, for example, between 1.2 and 1.5 grams of protein per kilo body mass per day. That's the uh, dev- uh, clinical advice for recovering patients. You know what they actually, so in the, in our hospital, so what they actually get, what they're being delivered is 0.8 grams. And so how much lean mass, like, oh, how much lean mass do they lose in four days of inactivity? Now we'll, come, we'll come back to that. So they get 0.8 and you would say like, oh, give them more. They consume 0.5. Mm. So they only consume, so the healthy patients in the hospital here, the healthy patients go for elective surgery in those four days, they consume 0.5 grams, which is one third of the uh, clinical guidelines for the advised amount. And they they lose about 1.4 kilograms. Wow. So they'll lose more than three pounds of lean mass in four days. Um, and I've, I've talked about this extensively on the podcast about the asymmetry in how quickly you lose versus how long it takes to get back. Um, and of course, we talk about this a lot in the context of falls that result in fractures, because here it's an even more vulnerable population for many reasons. First, unlike the elective hip replacement and the elective, elective knee replacement, uh, who's patients are generally very healthy and, you know, able to get back to PT quite quickly, especially in the hips. Uh, the people who are falling and fracturing femur and neck, uh, neck of femur and hip, um, they're typically not as healthy and they're much longer to get back to recovery and they're potentially uh, bedridden for much longer periods of time. And oftentimes they never make it back to the level of muscle mass, strength and function Prior to, in fact, I'm not sure if you're aware of this statistic. Uh, you, you probably are, but Adam Cohen on this podcast mentioned that, you know, we talk a lot about the 15 to 30 percent of people over 65 who will die within a year of a hip fracture. What we don't talk a lot about is the 50 uh, of the people who don't die, call it the 70 to 85 percent who don't die within a year. 50 percent of them never regain their same function pre-fall. Uh, in many ways, I find that statistic even more uh, uh, profound. I was giving lectures for a group of uh, older, older people, general public here, and I basically mentioned those numbers, not thinking about uh, basically what I was saying. So half the audience turned white when I said that, because of course, there were a lot of people that actually broke their hip. Um, but we took biopsies from patients coming in with a hip fracture after falling. And we compared that muscle with age-matched uh, people that didn't have a hip fracture, didn't have a fall, and we compared it with young women. In, in these, you know, most most women are the ones with the hip fractures because the men have already passed away. Uh, but you actually saw that the type, the size of the type two fibers, was tremendously smaller in the uh, women with the hip fracture than the ones that didn't have the hip fracture, even though we matched for almost everything, lifestyle and everything. Although that's a, what's very interesting there is the causality could be in reverse. I think you could also make a very compelling case that having smaller type two fibers, which means having less power, having less force generating capacity, um, would make you more susceptible to a fall. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a bi-directional association. Uh, so lower type two muscle fiber uh, size and density, much more predisposition to a fall. Once you are inactive, you now experience even greater atrophy, which as you pointed out earlier, atrophy of the type to a muscle fiber is, I would argue it should be described as one of the hallmarks of aging, right up there with, you know, decreased mitochondrial functioning, increased senescent cells, all of the things we typically think of with aging, we should really be adding atrophy, atrophy of type two fibers. And that's why maintaining muscle or maintaining uh, there is more than than maintaining muscle. It's also ma- especially maintaining the type two fiber size, 
because what we now often see with patients getting back, and especially now with COVID, we are sending people home much more fast because we don't want them to get a bacteria or anything like that, and we don't want them to, to attract COVID. So we send them home earlier. Now, what happens when a lot of older people go home, even if it's not a hip fracture, but an elective knee or hip surgery, the I mean, everybody means well. So children, grandchildren, well, actually, the first thing that they will do while you're in the hospital, they'll put your bed down, down, downstairs into the living room. So those people will never walk stairs again. First of all, they're afraid of walking stairs. They won't walk stairs again anymore because everything is put down. So they never recruit their type 2 fibers anymore. They might go for walks, but you don't recruit those type 2 fibers. So you need to stand up from the toilet several times in, in a row. You need to do or if possible, resistance training. You need to help have somebody do resistance training with you or walking stairs. You need to recruit those type two fibers because otherwise it just goes down. And I mean, that's very nice. I mean, we now believe that age-related muscle loss is not, I mean, it's a demographic, but it's not a physiological process of a slow decline in muscle. We now believe it's short successive periods of reduced physical activity that are actually experienced after which they don't fully regain their muscle. And that adds up in the two, last two decades of life. And that seems to be contributing to the muscle loss that we see in those demographics. Let's talk about that again, because I, I think that is such an important point that I want to make sure not a single person listening to us missed that point. Let me restate it, and I want you to clarify. We have long looked at data. These are all sorts of data. These are anthropometric data. These are functional data where we put activity monitors on people. And there is an unambiguous and clear decline in spontaneous activity, deliberate activity, and lean mass in the aging individual. And the decline starts somewhat slowly and by about the seventh decade starts to accelerate. By the seventh decade, uh, pardon me, by the eighth decade, when a person is in their 70s, the decline is so rapid that it appears almost irreversible. We would typically talk about this as an inevitability of aging. Hey, that's just the physiology of what happens to the muscle. But a minute ago, you said something entirely different which suggests that it is not inevitable and that it is not a continuous slope of decline that reflects some physiologic process within the atrophying muscle, but instead it's a series of discrete declines, each one precipitated by a period of inactivity. Some of them perhaps deliberate, meaning, hey, you know, I'm going on vacation for a week and I'm just going to sit on the beach and do nothing. And some of them forced upon us by injury or illness. Um, first of all, did I get it right? Is that what you basically said? Yes. And I think everybody has that observation. Think of uh, parents or grandparents that you saw uh, in the last, say, 10 years before they died. Everybody will say it started with that... Um, um, Urethra infection. Yeah, it started with that surgery on, on on the hip, and then you actually have all these little episodes, and then you saw that happening, and that's exactly what is happening. But this, of course, muscle centric. So I'm talking about muscle loss. Of course, if we're talking about cardiovascular disease and progression, that's a different story. Yeah. But for the the muscle loss is not something we don't believe anymore that it's in an individual. There's not a gradual loss over time. Because in the individual level, it can be completely different. The demographics show this because as we age, there are more people in that situation where they have su short successive periods of reduced physical activity. And I think one of the first people to actually publish this was Douglas Penn Jones, who unfortunately passed away himself at a way too young age. But he called it the catabolic crisis model. What I find interesting about that is you mentioned that maybe this doesn't apply to a decline in cardiorespiratory fitness or cardiovascular function, all these other things. Maybe, but I would argue that a muscle-centric view could potentially be the most important view because 
when your movement stops, everything else deteriorates with it. So, you know, people say, well, you know, what would that have to do with heart health or brain health? I would argue it has everything to do with heart health or brain health. When a person becomes sedentary, everything deteriorates in its wake. Of course, your cardiovascular system will deteriorate at an accelerated rate. Of course, we know unequivocally your brain will erode at an accelerated rate when you become inactive. And of course, we know that the quality of your life, your happiness, your well-being will deteriorate as you become inactive. And so you could make a very compelling case, I believe, that a muscle-centric view might be the most important view. No, I, I agree. And it's, it's like sometimes it's like talking to a mirror uh, <laughs> the way you respond. So uh, we've done bed rest studies in healthy people because we often use healthy young people as a model to see what, what inactivity does. And besides that 1.4 kilograms of muscle that we see disappear in a week, or if we immobilize a leg, almost 220 grams of muscle that is lost in a week, we also see a massive decline in oxidative capacity. We see a decline in insulin sensitivity. Um, so all of these markers that we have for cardiovascular and metabolic health go, go down in a single week of inactivity. So it's completely right. But of course, in one person, it might be the cardiovascular decline that is driving the muscle loss, while in the other person, it's the muscle loss that's driving the cardiovascular decline. Well, I'll, I'll make another shameless plug for an idea that we talk about a lot on this podcast, which is this, this idea of the centenarian decathlon, this idea that um, the best way to avoid this fate uh, when you're in your middle age, when you're young, whenever, is to be very deliberate and specific about the type of training and, of course, nutrition that is necessary to have the most physically robust final decade of life, what we call the marginal decade. And so if you train with great specificity to be very active and very independent and free of pain and all of those things in the last decade of your life, uh, by definition, you're going to be doing a lot of varied forms of exercise, and you're going to have to be supporting that nutritionally to get there. Uh -huh.